it's such an immense, 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 immense pleasure for me to be able to stand here today and to tell you and you and you and the pretty guy there with the beard, hi, <laughs> to tell each and every single one of you how much you matter, how much you matter because you're a person and not for all the reasons that everybody is telling you that you matter, but because you're a person and I'm going to go really quick to tell you about that. Um, I'm going to pretty much elaborate on three points. One is how you matter to yourself, and I'm going to look at that from a sort of healthcare perspective. The second one is how you matter to society, and I'm going to use a kind of an artistic lens to kind of look at what that is going to entail. Um, I've done a number on you because I do not have slides at all, so you're kind of stuck listening to me. <laughs> and uh, the third point is how you matter in the context of Nairobi and where Nairobi is going. And I'm just going to look at the kind of demographics and the people that we have here living in the city uh, to kind of explain that to you from a sort of meta kind of sense. So we're going micro, macro, and meta with where we're going today. All right, micro. Um, healthcare. A lot of people say that the healthcare system is broken globally, um, and I think there's shades of truth to that sentiment. And here's why. Hospitals, and I'm going to tell you this as a person who has worked in hospitals for a while now. Um, hospitals make money because they sell wellness to sick people. Right? So, the, by the mere fact that you're sitting here, most of you are not sick people. You're not in a bed in a hospital somewhere. And so that's how hospitals make their money. They see sick people, they do tests on sick people, they keep sick people in beds that they pay for, um, and they kind of follow up sick people. The sick people are always kind of giving out the money. And so with, with any industry, um, you have to follow the money to see what matters. And as you can see, if you're sitting here, you really don't matter to the healthcare industry because you're well and they are selling wellness. So if you already have wellness, you know, you're kind of seeing where I'm going with this. And so the WHO definition of health is a, a state of complete physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being, and not just the absence of, of, of disability and infirmity, all right? And so that's physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being. So I want you to think about mental especially, and psychosocial well-being, and ask yourself, are you going to get those things in a hospital? No. All right? So sometimes I feel like I shouldn't, in good conscience, call myself a health care provider. I'm more like a sickness care provider, health selling health, maybe, you know. But for the vast majority of people, and we are privileged to be among those people who are not in a hospital bed right now, um, you are the person who can take best care of yourself. You're, the, you're your own healthcare provider because you're really actually providing for yourself health, you know, the physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being, and you're also providing care to yourself. Care is conscientious attention, you know, um, paying attention to yourself, seeing where you're going. You're the one who's most conscious about where your path is going. And that's you and the people who matter to you. So those are the best care providers that you can have. And... There's a, there's a science called somatics. I've been accused of being a little bit of a, of a quack because of how much I like alternative, alternative um, care and alternative healthcare things. And the best thing about them is the way they make me think. And one of the fields is called somatics. And a prime thought in somatics is that the body remembers. All right? I want you to say that with me so that we can all wake up. The body remembers. One, two, three. Brilliant. And what that means is that the body remembers every single thing that you do to it. Okay? The body and the mind are intimately involved in the whole process that is living. And when the body remembers, if you think about that, it means that for the best sense of health and wellness, probably the best thing you can do for yourself is to give yourself good memories. Yeah? Give your, your body good things to remember. So eat good food, stuff that doesn't come from a packet, for instance. You know, stuff that didn't come from a factory. Stuff that you don't see on a billboard, maybe. Um, have a good orgasm. Oh, my God. A good one, okay? Let's not be having, you know, substandard interactions with other people. Make them count. Give your body good memories, all right? The body remembers. Are we together? 
Excellent. And that's how you provide best care for yourself. Remembering that the body remembers and giving your body good memories. I'm done with the micro. Let's go into the macro now. Um, Looking at things from an artistic lens, it's very interesting to see how the world has kind of shifted. And art has moved from being only on a stage, only limited to a screen, trapped in frames, you know, um, and only a, a field for the people who practice it and the people who love it or who have been trained to love it, the way we see, like art critics and people who've studied art, art history, everything like that. Art has moved from the private sphere into the public sphere. So art is nowadays in the street, art is in the public sphere, art is in people's bodies, we're seeing more and more beautifully tattooed people, we're seeing reemergences of tribal patterns and beautiful things like that. Um, and so art has moved from the private to the public sphere in that sense and into an experimental space. So we can see how um, everybody is making their YouTube video of themselves covering Rihanna singing closer. You know, and that's brilliant and it's wonderful. Not everybody's good at it and that's fine. And that's the beauty of this whole experimental thing. So some people can be good at it and others can be bad at it or whatever. But everybody's like moving more deliberately into practicing art than they were before um, and being more involved in art. And in that sense, um, I need to share with you one very major point and that is that the industry, and that's the industry that generates art to be able to put out to the masses. The industry gains with as much, with as much silence as there is among people because then they don't have to change anything that they're doing. Um, I was reading the other day about how for the longest time it was very difficult to have a person of color and a person who was white on a screen together because you had to light them differently and the cameras were wired in such a way that the, 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 the default to, to, to take the photo properly is the white person. And so for the longest time everything has been just kind of evolving since then and nowadays I mean with the advent of digital photography and all these other, um, all these other inventions, it's, these things are not such a big deal anymore, but they used to be, you see? And things like that. Another thing is, for instance, the Bechdel test. How many people have heard of the Bechdel test? The Bechdel test essentially is, and it's one of my favorite things to kind of say, the Bechdel test is a test that's put on contemporary works of art, literature, film, um, stories, and essentially it asks, are there, is there more than one woman in that artistic space, whatever it may be, in the story, in the work of fiction? Is there more than one woman in that space? Do they talk to each other at any given point in time? And do they talk about something other than a man? Um, <laughs> and so when, when things like that come into consciousness and a lot of people have put some of their best loved works of art through the Bechdel test and it's amazing how many fail the Bechdel test. Either there's one woman and she's a, you know, a passing kind of character who's upholding somebody else, or if there are two women, they're only ever talking about a man or what a man is doing. You know, and there's, there's nothing wrong with men. I love men. I work with three very beautiful ones. Um, but um, in as far as, in as, far as art, art does not really reflect um, society, in which society do we live that women only get together to talk about men? That's not true. That's not true about the majority of women. And so if we don't, if we don't kind of get our heads together and see that art is reflecting reality properly, then all of us are losing. Okay? All of us are losing in as far as that isn't being done properly. Um, well, as I conclude that point, I want to say that we all oppressed um, and marginalized populations, and that's the women that I work with in the hospital, um, everybody in society who's oppressed for one reason or another, will gain agency. The closer to reality their stories are told in art. And let me explain that a little bit. If if a story is told about a doctor on a TV program, for instance, Grey's Anatomy, which everybody knows, um, <laughs> I will be the first to tell you that nobody has that much free time in a hospital. Nobody, absolutely no person. Like even just seeing somebody drinking a soda is a luxury. Um, <laughs> and so 
for, for me, and it's, it's a very facetious kind of example, but that's not my truth. Whatever comes closest to being my truth and closest to being put in mainstream media um, is what is going to give me agency. And agency to be able to tell people, yes, this is my truth. Agency to be able to start dialogue for people to say, do doctors actually live like that? Do they actually work like that? And I can say, yes, we do, you know? Um, and agency to be able to change things. So if people say, actually, that's quite unfair. Why do people expect doctors to work um, in, in, in conditions like that? How is it that patients are expected to sleep in, 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 in rooms that look like that, etc. et al.? For the, closest we, the closer we come to allowing truth um, to suffuse what our art and our experience of art is, when art is no longer just escape and we're just watching the financial and romantic aspirations of Filipinas aged between 17 and 35. Not that there's anything wrong with watching those things, but in as far as we continually separate ourselves from our, our reality um, with as important a uh, uh, medium as art, um, we are losing a very, a very important way that we can have agency and that all oppressed and marginalized communities can have agency as well. Um, in, as, I, as I wrap up again, this point about art, one of the things that we do at The Nest is called Forum Theatre, and Forum Theatre is beautiful in the sense that it's about society kind of just coming and talking through their own issues and finding solutions in real time for those issues or actually being honest and open about the fact that there's not always a solution. Um, so we have a scenario kind of acted out by actors on a stage and they will come and do a scenario once through. There's usually a very clear uh, pattern or not a clear one at all about who's oppressing who. And so the audience get to watch the scenario through again and when they see shades of somebody oppressing another person as opposed to having actual dialogue, they'll say stop. And then the moderator guides them through, and I'm usually the moderator. Um, the moderator guides them through how to kind of discuss all the elements of the oppression that they're seeing. There's usually a lot of debate. Some people don't agree that there was any oppression at all. Um, others are so passionate about the oppression, they must get everybody to see their side. And it's always a very beautiful kind of interaction. And that's one way of using art to kind of embody what your life is and gaining agency for yourself. Um, so that's how you can use art in the macro sense that gain agency for yourself. So either become a creator or co-create. Um, if you're not a writer, you can, you can find out what the writers are doing and say, if you guys want to film that, I'm willing to finance it and then have a business proposition about it. Um, or you can make noise about the things that you're watching. Are they true to you? Are they true to the people that you know? If you know somebody who is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender identifying and they're being portrayed as ro wrong, in the popular media, you can make noise about that and say that's not true. And so have agency for those people because you want their stories to be told to as close as truth as possible. All right? So art gives us agency in that sense. And that's how you can interact better with your society, by art giving you agency. My last and final point is about where the city of Nairobi is going um, in the kind of meta sense. If we think about it very honestly and openly, um, the bulk of the population that moves this city isn't sitting here because they don't have the luxury of being able to take a day off work to come and listen to the thoughts of somebody else because they have to make money for somebody. And these are the bulk of people in the, in the labor force, and that's either in the domestic or the corporate world. So you have your housemates, you have your cab drivers, you have waiters, all those people. Every, all, of, all of the people that a lot of us see when we are driving in our cars and they're walking to work and they're walking to town from wherever it is that they live and, and I know a couple of the talks ahead of me have kind of talked about what that is about. Um, if you want to know where Nairobi is going, Nairobi will go where they go. All right? It's, 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 really, not, it's really not us here in our little boxes we're going to see where Nairobi is going to go and if we really want to get involved um, in making sure that this city goes to a good place we need to make sure that that population is a population that is ministered to what are their needs yeah what are their needs in every single sense are they eating well 
people, you know, are they, are, they, are they relating well? And for the majority of them, they're living through a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of stigma. Your, there's the stigma of being in, 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 a, in, a, pop, in, a, in a career that seemed to be a low kind of income career or a low status career, um, and that's not good. And everybody's always, you know, wondering, so when are you going to move on to some, something else? And the person whose clothes you're washing or whose car you're washing is very interested in you remaining there to keep washing their car so that they can keep going to work on time. You see, and nobody left their house in Yala, nobody left their house in Taveta, nobody left their house in Kisumu, nobody left their house in Kiambu or Thika or Mandera or wherever it is that people come from to converge in, in cities. Actually, even city people themselves, nobody left their home where they also have children and where they also have things they could be doing to have their life aspiration as to always be a, 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 a matatu tout, to always wash cars, to always do things like that, okay? And so we need to think um, about how the people who are able to think about these things, how do we employ these people, yeah? What is the fast that is mini minimum wage right now? Um, are we helping with that? Are we helping uh, this particular population to reach a point where um, their health costs are not out of pocket? you know, so that they don't have to worry so much about being sick. Do we care when we separate them from their families four, five hundred kilometers away and then we make sure that there's no people are focusing on building roads in the cities and nobody's making sure that roads out of town are good so that they can travel to see their children, you know, things like that. Um, are we aware that these careers are very transitory in nature and so do we hire people knowing that or do we imbue shame and guilt when one of these workers wants to leave our employer and go elsewhere? Are we making sure that this population is happy? You know, are they relating well? Do they, do they enjoy themselves when they're not in, their, in your house? You know, are you mean to waiters? You know, are you mean to the person that bumps you in the street and they don't look like you so you can be however you want to be? People matter because they're people. And people matter because we all want the same things, each and every single one of us. So whether you're working here in this beautiful place or you're, you're, the, you're the person working for the person who works in this beautiful place, each and every single one of us wants the same things and we need to have an awareness that the other is not so other so that we can understand. Where Nairobi goes, we go, all of us go. And so a bunch of us can't move the city along and leave others behind. Yeah? So as I, as I conclude, 24 seconds, um, <laughs> remember that your body remembers, give your body good things to remember, good things. And remember that I said good orgasms, I'm the person who said that today. Um, <laughs> remember that you gain agency, the closer you come to having your stories told in as mainstream media as possible, okay? So make sure that your stories are being told, make sure they're being told honestly. And lastly, lastly, when Nairobi goes, we all go, and we all want the same things. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you.